So first I'd like to introduce our two co-moderators for this particular session. First we have Pamela Gavin, who's Chief Strategy Officer with Nord. And we also have Jane Larkindale, who's the Executive Director of the Duchenne Regulatory Sciences Consortium at CPATH. Please join me in welcoming them. Hi, and welcome back to the, um, the final, pa final panel of this meeting. I hope everyone's suitably caffeinated um, and conversations have been wrapped up for now. I um, just wanted to say a few words as we introduce this panel, May, primarily because I've heard a few, uh, f uh, had a number of questions from people in the audience, and I wanted to just cl clarify a few things. Firstly, we had a question right at the end of the last panel from one of the people who um, controls one of the Nord databases. I should make it clear that any data that you share with this initiative, you'll still have access to it, it's still your data, you can control how broadly it is shared. So if you're considering sharing data with us, don't worry, we're not taking it away from you. That um, it is still yours and you, um, you get, still have control of it. Secondarily, we're not collecting prospective data through this project. We're going to rely on the patient community, the in industry community, to collect new data. We'll be aggregating data that already exists, helping you to understand it, working with the disease communities to develop analytics to help you understand and use that data. Um, over time, we may be able to help you with best practices for collecting new data, but that's not the purpose of this. So please don't give up your natural history data. That's really valuable. Natural history studies, that's really valuable data. So I wanted to make that clear. And I think the focus of this panel will really drive that awareness, because what we're going to focus on with this panel is the value of projects that have already done, been done by the community. We're going to highlight some patient groups that have developed really good natural history studies or other data projects, and show how that's really accelerated drug development in certain areas. So, and hopefully that will, that will help you understand how we can build on the work the community's already done and is already doing, and make it bigger, improve on it, learn across diseases and learn within diseases. That's what the idea of the RDCA DAP is. At the end of the session, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A, both with the panel and generally about the project. So keep your thoughts, share them with us. We want to learn from you. And with that, I'd like to welcome our panelists. So on, on this panel, we have Michael Yeaman from the Guthy Jackson Foundation, Alexandra Cruz from the Platelet Su Disorder Support Association, Teresa Strong from the Foundation for Prada Willy Research, and Kevin Crudis from the FDA. And with that, I'm going to sit down and enjoy some great discussion with our panelists. So thank you very much for our, to our panelists for agreeing to sit down with us and talk about some of the really exciting projects that they've already worked on. Each of these organizations has a, has a story, a story of where they've aggregated data, developed data, built a database, and used that in some way. And I thought we'd open this panel by asking each of our panelists to talk a little bit about a project that they have done and how that's had impact in drug development. And perhaps we'll start at the far end with Teresa Strong from Prada Willy. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I'm uh, really excited to talk about our community, uh, which is the prader really syndrome community. So PWS is a rare neurodevelopmental disorder that affects multiple systems. So we have a, a lot of things going on with our kids and adults. Um, there are metabolic issues, endocrine issues, behavioral issues, a high risk for mental illness. And one of the most characteristic features of PWS is a lack of control of appetite. So uh, young adults, children with PWS uh, are always hungry and they have a, uh, don't have normal satiety signals, so they will overeat uh, and become morbidly obese if their environment is not completely restricted. Um, and so we've been working with Nord and the I Am Rare platform to help uh, advance natural history understanding of PWS and support drug development in our disorder. So we've been fortunate over the last few years, uh, probably the last three or four years, to have some interest from industry in, that are developing uh, drugs to control appetite, for example, and, and induce weight loss and behavioral uh, aspects as well. Um, and we've been working to uh, create a database that, uh, and the data that will support that drug development. And that has included many aspects. So uh, some of it is retrospective uh, natural history data, 
as Vanessa mentioned earlier, we now have a prospective study, a four-year study of how behavior changes over time and what serious medical events happen in our population. Um, and Vanessa mentioned that it, it uh, hit enrollment at six months. We actually over-enrolled, so we were seeking to enroll 500. We enrolled 700, which shows that this is a community that is really interested in um, helping industry and academicians understand their disorder and, and you know, optimize care and hopefully develop new treatments. So we have that going on. We've also used the registry to collect patient experience data, for example. We have ran a validated caregiver burden assessment through the registry longitudinally so we could look at how that changed over time and whether that might be a reasonable supportive endpoint for clinical studies. We have, with another industry partner, helped develop a clinical outcome assessment. So individuals with PWS show a lot of behaviors associated with anxiety. Um, they have a lot of OCD behaviors, a lot of repetitive questioning. And so with an industry partner, we developed uh, an, uh, a questionnaire about that and did some of the validation, so like the test retest validation through the registry. So we've been trying to use the registry in many different ways to support uh, the uh, drug development process. There have been some other studies that we've run uh, that have not been able to go through the registry. So for example, we recently did a, a mobile technology-based um, look at how weight changes over time in PWS, since weight is a really important characteristic. And we found when industry partners came to us and said, well, you know, what does weight look like in your population and how does it change over six months? We really couldn't even understand, you know, we didn't have the answers to very basic questions. So we used a mobile, uh, 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 a text-based system to enroll uh, 165 individuals, which is a lot of individuals in PWS, in the adolescence and adult range and monitored weight over six months. So we have that as a reference data set. Um, but we weren't able to integrate that into the registry, so we're really excited about these kinds of platforms that will allow us to bring different kinds of data sets together and integrate that in to get a really full picture of everything that's going on in our population to support drug development. Thank you, Teresa, and Alexandra Cruz. So, hi, um, I'm Alexandra Cruz with the Platelet Disorder Support Association. We work with patients who have immune thrombocytopenia. That's about 95% of what we do. Um, immune thrombocytopenia, or ITP, is what I'll call it from here on out, because immune thrombocytopenia is a mouthful, as is a lot of rare disease names, um, affects mostly adults. Um, it's chronic in mostly adults, and then it's actually acute, so it resolves within about six months for a majority of children. So ITP is an autoimmune bleeding disorder. Um, it's kind of a twofold in what we believe is the mechanism at this point where uh, patients are either not making enough platelets in their bone marrow, so they're at an increased, increased risk for bleeding, um, or their platelets are being destroyed in the spleen. So a lot of, <laughs> a lot of um, treatments, uh, we're actually very lucky in that we're part of the 5% of rare diseases that do have treatments established. There are around 16 treatments that can be currently used to treat ITP. Um, but because of the heterogeneity of disease, both in pathophysiology, um, natural history, and mechanism where we're not sure if it's you know, the first mechanism where your platelets are being destroyed or your, the second mechanism where your body isn't producing enough platelets, that we're finding that um, that might lead to ways that we could determine what treatment might be best for patients. So as far as um, the work that we have done with our ITP Natural History Study Patient Registry in collaboration with NORD, um, which has been really great, I think, for the ITP community. It's really launched um, PDSA into the research space. We do a lot of collaboration with our medical advisors as well as with industry and um, have presented a lot of the data from our registry to regulators. So we actually started our registry, uh, we launched it in February 2017 on Rare Disease Day, um, as with a lot of the different patient registries, and we actually had 100 patients enroll within 24 hours, which was really exciting. Um, currently, we have about 1,200 patients who are enrolled. Um, we have about 800 patients who have consented, and we have about 470, plus or minus a couple patients, um, who have completed one or more of five surveys. So our surveys cover demographics, medical history, 
treatments. And what we have found to be most important is quality of life. Um, so as I mentioned, there are a number of different treatments that are used as therapies for ITP, but it's really not a one-size-fits-all. Um, and what a lot of patients are complaining about is that treatments seek to address the platelet count, which is how we really determine whether or not a patient has ITP. But a lot of patients are complaining that treatments aren't addressing what they feel like is most important in quality of life, which is fatigue. We're finding that about 87% of ITP patients are feeling fatigued um, because of their ITP or because of the treatments. So, it was really exciting to launch back in February, and we've taken it kind of in two different directions. So the first direction that we've used our registry data is working with researchers and working with our medical advisors and presenting abstracts and presentations, um, as well as manuscripts at both the American Society of Hematology and the European Hematology Association uh, conferences, talking about the demographics of ITP, who's affected, who's not using treatments, who is using treatments, and then the second way that we have really um, utilized our registry data is we actually had a meeting with the FDA um, with the Office of Hematology and Oncology Products back in November of 2017, so only six months after we launched our registry, where we presented our, re uh, our research from the registry to them and really talked about the unmet need of ITP patients, where we were seeing that even though there are all, all these different treatments to treat ITP, actually about 40% of patients weren't on any sort of treatment at all. So there's a huge unmet need, I think, for drug development. And then finally, we actually hosted our first externally-led patient-focused drug development meeting in July of this past year, which was really exciting, was attended by FDA and over 300 ITP patients and caregivers. Um, and I just think it's really due to the registry that we have in collaboration with NORD. Um, and with the FDA, and I'm also really excited to say that I'm not sure if it was a coincidence um, or if it was due to the registry data, and of course all the hard work by our industry partners, but we've actually had two new ITP drugs approved within the last 14 months for the first time in 10 years, and we also have three more ITP drugs in the pipeline. So um, again, thank you to Nord and to the FDA. We couldn't have done this without you. Thank you, Alexandra. Our next pa um, panelist is Michael Yeoman from the um, Guthy Jackson Foundation. Good afternoon, Michael Yeoman. Uh, my day job, professor of medicine and chief of molecular medicine at UCLA. But I'm here today to talk with you about neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder and the foundation that Victoria Jackson and Bill Guthy, her husband, began in 2008 when her, their daughter, unexpectedly, unforeseeable, out of the blue, came down with an eyeball headache that led to optic neuritis, that led to partial blindness, that led to the story of the foundation that has gone from redefining the diagnostic criteria to establishing a longitudinal observational study that collects data and biospecimens to creating an industry council and an international clinical consortium, all the way to uh, redefining what a relapse is. And long story short, uh, very fortunate to have worked with uh, Dr. Dunn, Dr. Bastings, FDA Neurology, other leadership in the FDA, so that after 100 years plus of no clinical trials in NMOSD, uh, in the last three years, four clinical trials were performed. All had extremely positive results. June 27th, first drug ever approved for NMOSD. Two others in the pipeline were very optimistic. And I would just sort of add, you know, in addition to good fortune, the foundation has really benefited from a little bit of a different approach. The tagline for the foundation is a rare approach to a rare disease. And so, for instance, one of the things we did very early on was to coalesce everything that was known and everything that was not known in the field and publish a paper that, you know, after hearing the, the concepts of integrative and continuum, sort of is rewarding because the title of the paper was Integrative Continuum, uh, a, a, a Rare Approach to Solutions in, in Autoimmune Disease. And that actually got a lot of people's attention. We did not publish it where you might expect. It was not in neurology. It was in the uh, annual reviews of pharmacology and toxicology. 
And that has a very high impact factor, and it brought to the table uh, bridge builders, as was mentioned earlier, people from engineering and uh, biochemistry and um, marketing, and of course, industry and biomarker discovery, et cetera, et cetera. But the idea was to get a wide variety of perspectives into the room. And the goal was parallax, to see a solution from many perspectives that cannot be seen by any one alone. And so it's that sort of a story that I'm happy to be here and really thank Nord, the FDA, and others. Jake, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Our next, our next panelist is Kevin Curtis from the um, Department of, uh, Division of Neurology at FDA. And his story is somewhat different being a regulator, not a patient foundation. Kevin? Yeah, I suppose I could speak a little bit about uh, the work that we've done with uh, CPATH as well. Um, so as part of uh, uh, my uh, role in DNP, I've worked a lot with uh, the consortia uh, from CPATH that have been involved with um, uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Huntington's, uh, DMD, and might be one other one. Um, so I've seen over the past uh, few years the work that uh, has gone into collecting all uh, the data from different uh, uh, sponsors and academic um, uh, uh, collaborators and how important uh, the process is to get that data to a standard where we can talk with you and really come up with uh, solutions that you've seen. Uh, some of the examples, uh, Samantha talked about um, the uh, tool, the uh, clinical trial simulator uh, tool that we have uh, um, uh, declared uh, uh, as fit for purpose. Um, I think that was uh, five years ago or so. And uh, we're starting to see the fruition of the other groups as well. So, for example, the uh, project you're involved with, uh, DMD, we're starting to see um, the use of the uh, trial simulation tools to really get a handle of how best to plan for the clinical trials. So we saw earlier about uh, the key questions uh, for planning these trials, uh, patient population, um, uh, time of the study, the, uh, the assessments that are made. And we're starting to see that uh, the tools that are coming out of what we're seeing with uh, these collaborations are really uh, leading to a fruitful uh, discussion uh, with us and uh, sponsors to come up with a good solution uh, for patients. Thank you, Kevin. And our last panelist is Ron Bartek from the Friedrichs Ataxia Research Alliance, who is a very good friend of mine. <laughs> thank you, Jane. And uh, thank you, Jane and Pam, for including us on, on the panel. You asked about the program that has helped us most in um, developing a platform for therapy development. I'm going to triple your pleasure and say ours, our program uh, that's helped so much in that regard is really a triad of projects, the first leg in which is um, our patient registry, which is really a demographic, primarily uh, demographic registry that we use as a recruitment tool, has just enough uh, staging information to help us, help instruct us on which patients are um, likely to be eligible for which clinical trial and which ones of them live close enough to the uh, trial site uh, to be effective. Um, and um, the second uh, leg in the triad is the clinical network that we've uh, developed and supported over time. Um, and it consists of uh, clinicians and uh, coordinators that uh, both know our patients and know our disease well and conduct our clinical research. And the mothership of the triad is, as you would um, guess, uh, our natural history study. And um, I, I think it might be informative to tell you a little bit about how we developed that natural history database, because it really does demonstrate how inseparable are such things as um, clinical outcome measures or endpoints and um, natural history. Um, and I say it that way because we didn't set out to uh, create a natural history database. We had just gotten wind, this is like uh, 18 years ago, we had just gotten wind of the first um, small molecule that might have shown some promise in our disease. 
And of course, being uh, fairly new to the business, we decided, well, what we really need to do is put that compound into a clinical trial. And fortunately, we were meeting with people who knew better <laughs> what they were doing, like at the NIH, and they said, whoa, uh, you won't be able to do a clinical trial until you have clinical outcome measures that will show the FDA the difference between success and failure. So we really set out to uh, develop what we were calling ataxia scales. Um, scales that would uh, provide the basis for a Friedrich's ataxia rating scale or a set of endpoints for our clinical research. Um, we decided to do it um, by assembling 14 patients and 10 clinicians that knew our disease well and met all day, one day um, at the NIH, had the 10 clinicians examine each of the 14 patients with a series of examinations and tests that we largely borrowed from other disease groups like multiple sclerosis and, and we used a, a standard neurological examination of each of the 14 patients um, as the, the sort of the foundation of, of our examination. Um, we then did that again, the same 10 clinicians and the same patients, 18 months later without intervention and uh, examined them in the same way with the same tests. Uh, the most, uh, what was determined to be the examinations or tests most sensitive to change over that 18 month period uh, were then assembled and uh, farmed out to five clinical sites that we, with help from the Muscular Dystrophy Association, supported. Uh, we started them, here are the, here are the clinical measures. Uh, examine as many patients as you can get uh, come to your center. Uh, we funded that um, investigation for four years, again with help from the MDA, um, and um, that uh, after the first year, it was clear to us having seen some of those data, this looks an awful lot like natural history data, so it became our natural history study at the same time it was instructing our clinical outcome measures. That, that system has continued. Instead of five sites, we now have a dozen that are global. Um, instead of uh, 14 patients, we now have uh, over 1,200 patients that have been examined over a, a period of uh, at least 15, year, well, 15 years at most. Um, and um, we're using that like you would any of your natural history databases to instruct our uh, clinical trial design. Um, so those, that's our triad, and, and uh, uh, that's the project that's gotten us furthest along the line of doing therapy development. So um, can you all hear me? Great. Uh, for our panelists, if it, especially those who have um, been involved in uh, natural history study development, is there one or two things that you would say were super critical to the successes you've achieved to date that you could share with the audience, people both in person and online who may be embarking upon this maybe earlier on in the process? Um, sure, so I think one thing that was really integral in starting our registry is to get patients involved as early as possible, making sure that patients and caregivers have a voice in developing protocols, in asking the questions that they want answered most. Um, and of course, having, you know, as a patient advocacy organization, we actually don't currently have um, anyone with a intense medical background on our staff. We have a staff of about eight people. Um, and so I think both having our medical advisors review for scientific rigor as well as um, being able to, for us, at least work with Nord, who is able to help us along the way um, with such a small staff, which of course is the case with a lot of rare disease organizations. So being able to, I think, learn from others um, as well as integrating patient voice. Yeah, I would just add a couple of things. Uh, one is the importance of being adaptive to try to build forward so that there can be change and evolution integrated into the process. Uh, the snapshot effect is one of the biggest barriers to advances, be they biorepository or otherwise. 
So especially in rare diseases where new knowledge changes the landscape of the field a lot, um, definitions are going to change. And you don't want to build something only to learn a year down the line that, oops, now we have to redefine things, go collect a bunch of other data, and kind of start over again. Uh, other things include don't simply accept dogma when thinking about a repository. Uh, a couple of examples. Um, when, we were collect when we were designing the uh, biospecimen collection, uh, we made sure to be able to collect and preserve biospecimens so that we could analyze in a future forward-looking way things that we might not be able to do today, but that will probably become important tomorrow. So for instance, classical genomics misses a lot of very possible uh, genetic uh, determinants of disease, uh, including epigenetics, of course, but even things like copy number or gene dosing effects, et cetera. And if you simply do genomics as has been done conventionally, you might be missing really important determinants of disease. Uh, lastly, I would just, you know, suggest that you preserve options. So when you're developing a consent form, of course, IRBs will push back when you say, we would like to be able to use these data and biospecimens for anything we want. But if you sort of work with them and give them a sense of, you know, we know that there are some things that are knowledge driven that we want to apply the data and specimens to, Yet, there, we know there are some things that are discovery driven that we don't yet know, but we'd like to be able to apply these without having to reconsent people. And so, doing as much as possible to build that in up front has really proven uh, helpful in our experience. Thank you, Michael. And, and Teresa, you have. I would just add to that, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I think those are some great points. I think another uh, thing that shouldn't be neglected is educating your rare disease community about the importance of natural history studies. I think everybody in this room understands the importance of natural history studies and why they support drug development, but it's not necessarily intuitive to your patient community. Um, and there's a lot of stress. You, you know, parents have a or, or, or patients or parents have a lot of things to do. So helping them understand why it's really important to participate and provide their data and, you know, whether they're, uh, they or their loved one is doing well or not doing very poorly, like how we need that entire spectrum so that we do, we can understand the variability that comes along with a disorder I think is also very important. So it sounds like don't let perfection be the enemy of the good. Yeah and to start early are some of the key things and to communicate expectations. Um, Ron? So I'd like to add, all of these are wonderful comments with which I fully agree and um, like to expand in our case on the f importance of having uh, developed a, a culture uh, that's conducive to all of this. A culture of uh, collaboration. It, there should be a better word for this kind of uh, full, full-hearted collaboration. It's, it's building uh, that kind of collaborative uh, uh, feeling with our dear colleagues and friends at the FDA, uh, the same kind of people at the NIH, uh, all of our patient families, the other stakeholders like our academic investigators and our industry partners. Um, and it's this kind of collaborative spirit that's done all kinds of things uh, for that triad I mentioned, um, take natural history, for example, and the outcome measures, endpoints that we developed. It, the, the, the system I described to you of how we developed that natural history database and, and the uh, endpoints that we, we still use, uh, also done in close collaboration with the FDA. It was their recommendations and uh, suggestions that modified our first Friedrich's ataxia rating scale that came out of that extended process, and so now it's called the modified Friedrich's ataxia rating scale, and that was because of recommendations we got from our FDA colleagues, and um, you know what has been mentioned to the importance of doing these patient-focused drug development meetings, including the externally led meetings, um, and the very important voice of the patient report that 
is produced in, in these meetings. We know how uh, deeply um, the FDA has been moved by hearing our patients' voices and um, how that is affecting the way they conduct their reviews and, and their business with our disease group and all of our disease groups. It's just vitally important. And in terms of collaborating fully with our industry partners, that's why I'm sitting here today, because as you heard earlier today, um, our very fortunate disease group has been fortunate enough to help lead the charge in, in terms of this um, uh, institute's um, you know, data sharing and analytical program. Um, and that's because our industry partners are part of that collaborative culture. They, we already have four large data sets that from their um, baseline and placebo data uh, from their clinical trials they've conducted. Three more data sets are being processed as we speak. So that's how we're enriching our natural history database and that's all because of this collaborative culture that everybody knows we're all in all together all the time. Thanks, Rod. Add, just That's the point, right. and just uh, stress the importance of uh, clear um, uh, standards for how data is coming in and being uh, collected. So uh, we know there could be variability in site to site in how tests are performed or how assessments are performed. So I just want to stress the importance of having a protocol and clear standards so that if uh, such data is going to come uh, forward in the future for regulatory applications, that we have the confidence that we're dealing with data that. Um, uh, has the quality that meets our expectations. Thank you, Kevin. Good point. And thanks, Kevin. You stole my question. My, my, que my question, which was going to be um, how, what you need to see in a natural history study. What I'd like to offer to any of the panelists who'd like to answer is um, how you've in integrated, worked with the regulators as you developed your registries and natural history studies to ensure that they meet the regulatory need. And probably, perhaps a follow up to Kevin as well as to what, what beyond standards makes for a useful natural history study as you're reviewing some of the analyses that you've had to see through the years. Maybe we'll start with Kevin as he started the, to answer the question, and then we'll move on to the other groups. I was thinking um, uh, beyond the standards, having um, a consistency, like I said, across the sites that uh, data is being collected, as well as uh, data that is uh, contemporaneous. So, um, of course, that's more helpful if we have data that is collected in the last uh, few years, as opposed to data that is collected, you know, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, where uh, standards of care, you know, could have changed over the course of that uh, time period. So that's an important factor t to make sure that um, standard of care and um, treatments that patients are receiving are consistent with what we're seeing in uh, uh, current day uh, patients who would be enrolled in a clinical trial. Thanks. And I know several of the groups mentioned early interactions with FDA as they were developing natural histories or as, as their registries developed. And Alexandra, you mentioned you, um, you some engagement with your externally led patient-focused drug development meeting, and Ron referred to the same meetings. Can you tell us a little bit more about how your registry data um, informed that and how that's informed drug development? Yeah, absolutely. So it was really, really exciting. It was definitely a heavy lift for a small staff um, to put together one of these externally led patient uh, patient-focused drug development meetings. Um, we did have a lot of guidance with the FDA, so that was exciting as well um, and a huge help. Um, so I would say that that initial meeting that I spoke about earlier in November of 2017, where we presented our registry data to the FDA was really, I think, the, the initial um, step forward on all of our communication and collaboration um, with the agency. Um, we presented our data on demographics. We presented uh, information on treatment type. We presented information about diagnosis. We know that from our registry data, it actually takes over a year to receive an ITP diagnosis in about a third of patients, which is way too long. Um, and again, we talked about quality of life. So a lot of the data really, I think, communicated to the FDA that there is a need um, for further drug development as well as the other unmet needs of ITP patients. Um, and as far as our patient-focused drug development uh, meeting went, um, it was just really exciting, I think, kind of to echo Ron's sentiments that um, the FDA needs to hear from the patients themselves. Um, about what they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And we did do some um, very brief uh, 
mentions of what we were seeing in our registry, but we really wanted it to be directly, we wanted the data to come directly from the patient, so we actually conducted polling throughout the entire um, meeting, and so it was live polling, which we found to be really exciting because you were able to see in real time um, what everybody in the room, as well as uh, everyone on the live stream, was experiencing through their ITP journey. So, of course, we, we really love data. <laughs> I'd like to just pick up on something Michael mentioned earlier, and um, that was that y you have to remain flexible and, and learn from what you're learning about your disease and modify the uh, input to natural history database as you go along. Um, I already mentioned how important it was to us uh, to talk with our FDA colleagues about how to modify our initial endpoint, the Friedrichs Taxi Rating Scale and that, that's produced uh, an acceptable endpoint for our clinical trials. But also, as we've gone along and learned more from our patients' voices about which symptoms are most important to them, we're developing additional measures to insert into our natural history uh, study. We add a hearing test, we add a speech test, um, and to pick up things that are vitally important to um, the way they, they can perform their activities of daily living and impact on their quality of life, which brings up an entirely uh, additional um, aspect of this kind of flexibility, and, and um, that is that we know how important it is to our FDA reviewers to demonstrate that our patients are actually feeling and functioning at least a little bit better on a daily basis. They're that much better able to perform their activities of daily living and the therapeutic is having an impact, positive impact on their quality of life. That calls into play a whole different set of additional endpoints, doesn't it? Things that we could use like wearables and carryables that could report on the way the patient's feeling and functioning on a daily basis in their own home environment to supplement the clinical trial data from our clinical sites. So th this is all, as Michael indicated, uh, a, sit a sit situation in which we have to remain flexible and growing and, and developing better and better ways, especially when you're trialing, as almost all of us usually are, uh, compounds that at best would, would provide incremental benefit if that's so hard to detect, as you know, and so you need uh, more and more refined endpoints to pick up that kind of incremental improvement, and so you have to continue to evolve. Maybe I could just add our specific experience and, and offer a, a couple of very, very specific examples. So for the first few years in focusing on NMO, we targeted understanding the disease at the molecular and cellular level on one hand, and understanding the patient experience in parallel. It's one thing to ask a patient, what's the matter with you? As it implies dysfunction and you know, numeric quantification of why you are not able to do something. It's a very different question to ask, what is the matter to you? So whereas EDSS might be some quantitative way of understanding disability, really what a patient wants to know is, when can I take my child for a walk? That's the basic difference in that simple change in the question. In 2013, we were very fortunate to work with Dr. Dunn, Dr. Bastings, um, neurology leadership at FDA, to bring together KOLs and industry leaders who were, at that point, highly interested in NMO, uh, yet weren't sure how to design a trial, given that placebo in a catastrophic disease where relapses can cause permanent paralysis or blindness might be considered you know, over, the, uh, over the threshold of ethical. But working with Dr. Dunn, it became very clear that that was actually the best thing to do for patients to minimize equipoise. The last thing any of us wants to do is waste a bunch of time and money only to come up with an ambiguous answer that helps no one. And so that helped the foundation then refocus, if you will, on its biorepository to address key outcome measures that would be necessary in clinical trials. For example, all the clinical trials to date have focused on time to relapse as their main outcome. 
Well, in order to know time to relapse, we needed to collect interval information so that we could give a projection of when relapses might be expected. And we developed a way to understand annual relapse rate within a patient and among the cohorts of patients. Also in that experience, we worked with uh, academia to understand that there are really multiple variants of NMO. Um, one is anti-aquaporin-4 positive. One is anti-MOG positive. One is seronegative. And so this created the opportunity to collect and enroll patients um, that aligned to the, uh, the uh, goals of that particular clinical trial, but that also could be stratified for sub-analysis in ways that allowed determination of benefit or not in each of these variants. So just examples of how working early with FDA really helped uh, the NMO field overall, not just in the clinical trials, but to understand and redefine the disease. So at that point, NMO became NMOSD, and new diagnostic criteria were published. Uh, we published a paper on uh, emerging opportunities and challenges in clinical trial design. We proposed an adaptive trial network where patients in a rare space might have an opportunity to enter an adaptive trial design so that they could be um, provided opportunities. That's a big challenge to get a bunch of companies to you know, agree to terms at the beginning of a large clinical trial network. And we're still working toward that goal. But in the meantime, I just am emphasizing the importance of working with FDA early. And I'll just pick up on the themes of flexibility and also integration of, of different aspects of your tools. So I would agree that um, we have so many new opportunities with the mobile technologies to be engaging a patient population, and especially in rare disease where it, it, people are dispersed and it's very difficult to get to the few academic centers of excellence. I think mobile technology is going to be a wonderful way to bring that together and really understand the natural history and how the natural history is changing over time. Our, our disorder, like many others, the age of diagnosis is, is dropping and uh, early interventions are increasing, so it is kind of a moving target. Uh, and then the other theme of uh, using multiple tools and bringing them to the FDA early. So we have not had a uh, patient-focused drug development meeting, but we do uh, did develop an international consortium of multiple stakeholders, industry, academics, and patients and patient groups. Um, and had a critical path innovation meeting at the FDA. So we're able to bring some of the same data from the natural history study as well as information on patient treatment preferences uh, and discussion of endpoints that are suitable for our population uh, to the FDA in that manner. So there are a lot of uh, uh, integrating parts and can be used in a lot of different ways. And I think to Pam's point, getting started somewhere and, and starting to build, there's it can be a little bit overwhelming, all of the things that need to be done, but, but starting in one spot, it'll start to lead you down, down a path of, of new things to do. And thank you for that. And I think that summarized everyone's comments really quite nicely of starting small, starting with a, with a smaller number of endpoints, talking to the FDA early, getting some consensus, particularly as we start developing some of these more novel next, next generation endpoints, I think are all very nice themes. And, I'm hoping this RDC ADAPT program will help to help us develop some best practices that we can share with new communities as new projects are developed. What about things that you would have done differently? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, the, just the one or two. I, I could walk that plank. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that is um, a surprise, unless you sort of think through things like collecting data and biospecimens, um, include the cost burden uh, for things that you, you know, might not anticipate. You know, it's sort of the be careful what you wish for sort of phenomenon. We were very fortunate to, uh, in, a, in a rare disease that had a prevalence of about one in 100,000 when we began, and it's now about five in 100,000. Very fortunate to have enrolled 1,200 NMO patients and about 300 controls. 
And one of the things that we were fortunate to build into our repository was the collection of um, data and biospecimens from patients who had um, non-NMO autoimmune diseases of the CNS, as well as um, blood relative controls. And we did that intentionally. Um, the blood relatives uh, were collected mainly to address the concept of resilience. Why is it that one member of a family that's exposed to everything that the rest of the members are, including some twins in our repository, why is it that one person is afflicted and the others are not? So it's sort of working from the negative space, not just to look at what is there, but what is not there and why there wasn't sort of um, immune checkpoint tolerance uh, to some of these um, autoantigens. But in collecting these biospecimens, which we now have uh, over 100,000 biospecimens, unless you want it to be a museum, you've got to design it in a way that is accessible, uh, that has purpose-driven approaches, sort of knowledge-driven. You know what you're going to do with this stuff, at least in part, to begin with but then provide the opportunity to look at it down the road as well. It's the down the road part that gets to be very expensive. So I can just you know, tell you our repository now is just the storage fees for the biospecimens are over half a million dollars per year. Now that's sort of a good problem to have because we have this huge repository with very rich information in biospecimens that has launched 40 or 50 research studies that have led to really breakthrough science. But it is not free. And that's got to be sort of anticipated in how to sustain these going forward. You want them to last as long as they can, yet you don't want them to last forever. You want them used. Your goal is to have all the biospecimen used and some big discovery made so that there's a cure. You don't want to develop a museum. Else? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. So, <laughs> a, a registry at this point, there, I, I would characterize it as pretty qualitative. So, we'll ask what different types of treatments, but we don't necessarily ask, and how did you feel when you were taking this treatment, or correlate it to more quantitative values. Where were your platelet counts at when you were taking this treatment? So I think if we were to do it over again, we would ask more specifically and kind of delve more into how patients were responding both to treatment, how they felt with quality of life. Because it's very um, it's very difficult, I think, to be able to correlate and say, you know, based on our quality of life survey, this patient felt good. Well, was it because of your response in the treatment section, you felt good because you were taking this treatment and here's how you felt about it. So I think it's difficult, especially with a natural history study, to be able to correlate kind of based on time. So if we could figure out a way to do that, I'm all ears. <laughs> I wouldn't say so much a regret as a, a, a real challenge yeah. uh, is that it, you know, the time spent engaging all of the different stakeholders is critical, and yet for small organizations, like that, it's a lot to do. So to make sure that um, it's not only the patients who are the most engaged, but you're trying to get a representation of your entire patient population, so trying to engage, uh, you know, people who are, who are not kind of on your doorstep as the patient uh, organization, and, you know, Engaging regulatory takes quite a bit of effort, and then making sure that the academics are engaged and the industry partners. So I think that it's, it's a challenge, and all of that time is well worth it, but uh, I think there is a temptation to, to kind of skip all that <laughs> because it's easier to do, you know, without spending that much time developing those relationships, but those relationships are really critical to being, in the end, having it be as, as good as it could be, so. Thank you. I can definitely appreciate the $500,000 maintenance costs. That's why I think a lot of organizations don't start the smaller ones with biorepositories because it's a, it's a big nut to crack to support regularly and they have to make a decision. Do we fund re a researcher with that money or 
So it's a good point that you brought up because I don't think it's, it's come up yet in the conversation today. Thank you, Michael. Perhaps I can follow up with Teresa just to continue the point you were just making about time working with the different partners. Can you talk a little bit about the interactions you've had with industry? What do they want out of your, out of your registry and how have your registries or natural history studies been useful to industry as drugs have been developed? Well, I think, you know, their interest, uh, there, there's a lot of interest. I mean, they, they want to understand the disorder. They want to understand how behavior changes in our disorder over time. Um, they're interested in understanding what medications that our uh, individuals are already on so they can be thinking about how they're going to develop their clinical trials. So that's important information uh, for them. Um, I think understanding, and this is why we're looking prospectively in serious medical events, um, understanding what sends people to the doctor or hospital is really important for them if they're gonna run a clinical trial and you know understand what might be drug-based complications versus you know just natural history. So uh, I think, and, and then patient experience also, what is important to the patient community, what needs to be treated because, I mean really I, I think they don't wanna be developing a drug for something that is not important to our community. So they want us, you know, us as the patients to be really, uh, engaged and wanting that treatment as well. So, so lots, lots of different things. Thank you. And Alexandra, you mentioned that there have been two new drugs that have um, come on board very recently and that this may or may not have had something to do with your, your registry data. Did, they, um, have, did the companies interact with you and ask for specific information from your registry? Did, how did they use your data? Um, so, so that's a really good question. Um, so at this point, the short answer is no. And here's why. <laughs> um, so with our registry, um, one thing that we'd like to do moving forward would be to develop a protocol in conjunction with our medical advisors to have de-identified access to data based on what industry partners, regulators, and other researchers. <laughs> Can everyone hear me now? <laughs> um, what all of these, you know, different key opinion leaders would like to see with ITP patients um, for the data. Um, we have actually had, we have about 10 different industry partners. Every single one of them has asked us, when can they see our data? So that's definitely something we're, we're going to be doing um, looking forward, as well as half of our medical advisors have asked for access to the data and a majority of external researchers. And again, I wanna be clear that we're not hoarding the data. I was the one who asked earlier about whether or not we would still have access to our own data. Um, it's simply, we want to make sure that patient information is protected. Perhaps, um, Ron, you could comment on what, how the Friedrichs community has changed as a basis of your natural history study. Well, I, I could start with the conclusion and then double back, and the conclusion is that with this triad of um, programs, the patient registry, uh, the clinical network, and our natural history database, our whole landscape has changed drastically from the zero drug companies and zero drug trials that we had when we first established the foundation uh, to one of um, now more than three dozen industry partners actively pursuing um, treatment strategies in our disease, and um, about two dozen clinical trials already complete. Um, and um, another indicator is, uh, another metric is we started with, we were able to assemble 80 scientists at our first international scientific conference, and the common ground was they could all, all but one could spell Friedrich's ataxia. And um, now we're about to have our seventh such international meeting that this wonderful woman to my right is uh, generating for us this November. Um, and that will have about 450 scientists that are devoting most of their careers to, to our rare disease. So um, that, those are pretty cool metrics. And Kevin, you see, you see things from, the, uh, from a different aspect. Uh, 
How would you say you see the field where there's good natural history data versus the areas where perhaps nobody's been collecting this kind of data? What, what do you see in terms of the drugs that, are, that come to you as regulators? Well, I, I think we see uh, quite um, a variation in terms of what we're seeing, I should say. Um, so I think it's important to stress uh, the importance of um, uh, the groups to come in and talk to us early and to plan for this um, because we have seen uh, some examples where um, a certain group ha has gone along to a certain point and then has come in to us and talked to us and at that point it's a bit late and it's, it's a lot of data that has gone, you know, is it, not very useful. So again, the importance of talking to us early to really plan the, the goals of uh, uh, what the point is of, of collecting all that data to have a plan in the future uh, to use it for an application. I think that's, that's the most important uh, point, I would say. Thank you. And Michael, you've, you've also worked with companies um, looking at your data and such like in somewhat different situations. You have a biorepository as well as clinical data. What have companies wanted from your database and biorepository? Different companies want different things. And I think that's one of the themes in the sort of flexibility and, and adaptive um, approach to developing a biorepository, you know, I guess one thread that goes through all of this is to be realistic in real world. So, you know, all stakeholders need to have some win in the process. It can't simply be that, you know, one company has an advantage and others don't, or patients get the information and they, you know, own it and don't give it away, et cetera. It's gotta be everybody in the room wins something. And it's just a matter then of finding um, the, the um, goals that best align to each stakeholder. And that involves sort of a United Nations degree in uh, diplomacy sometimes, but it's doable. And I think the idea is the more realistic you approach a company with respect to understanding that they want something out of this, the more willing they are to not only engage with the foundation, but we've had very good success in creating cross, I should use a different word, um, more inclusive company collaborations. So for example, we just published a paper where we had multiple companies work with us to perform a quality of life study. And the, the, the company uh, representatives who were included in the authors, of course, had all their disclosures and, you know, no, made any perceived or real conflict of interest um, minimal. But what it did was it showed the patient community that companies are in this with the patients. Because if companies are willing to sort of, you know, get together and approach patients in a very appropriate way, the companies never directly talked with the patients, et cetera. But to work with a foundation and a professional biostatistical and, and survey um, implementation uh, company, it just is a signal that the companies are not in this to um, exploit anyone. And I think that is a mindset that if you can help patients understand that, uh, everybody wins. Um, and you'll get more sort of uh, buy-in from everyone. I think you're speaking our language here. Collaboration involving industry, involving patients, involving patient groups, involving nonprofits like ourselves, um, and involving the regulators from that, right from the start. If we're all in this together, working together, we can move this forward. That's very much what we want to do with this RDC ADAPT program, because no one of us has all the expertise and all the knowledge that we need to do this. Working together, I think we can have a huge impact. So I think you're really talking about the success of working together rather than working against each other and trying to pull forward as a rare disease community, which is something very important to me, and I know it's very important to Nord as well. Uh, one other thing that I've seen in the community is when is this um, an area to focus on is this notion of we've got to get it all right the first time. and. Michael, your comments about flexibility and adaptability really rung uh, true to me. And often what happens is they say, well, we want to know everything. We want to ask every question. We, you know, this is our chance. And they're all valid thoughts and concerns, but, but sometimes that becomes too big of, of a lift the first time around. And like you said, you learn new, new things as you go. So you need to have that be adaptable. 
and then also having a sense for what your goals and objectives are for the study. They can change and evolve over time, but if you're just going to ask every question <laughs> under the sun and because you think it's your only chance to do so, you're also going to have people who are going to be fatigued or say this is too big of a lift. So I think that's another thing that we've seen in working with folks that it's an urge that you, if you can balance it out a little bit and recognize that there will be an opportunity for that as you evolve and bring the community with you um, and empower them to be part of the solution, I think it's, it's, it's a great way to go. Could I just add a corollary to that, Pam, um, from the perspective of our, of our industry partners? Because what we've seen most excitingly uh, over the last few years is that the industry partners are now uh, coming to the patient groups to get it right. You know, and they're not coming to the patient groups with the solution. What we need, I can remember in one of our early city uh, meetings, the uh, you know, clinical trial transformation initiative meetings, hearing from some industry part, one industry partner, what's all this about patient engagement? We don't need patients engaged until we need to recruit them for a phase three. You know, what, what's this about? And now, I mean, we've got large companies, the largest companies in the world coming to us before they have a target, before they have a, a, a compound, because they want to learn from our patients what target tissues are most important to them, what compounds they might have in their inventory that might be helpful, and uh, what our natural history database shows. So they're coming to us to design their clinical trials after they come to us to decide on what their targets are. You know, so it's, it's working. Great, that's terrific. So my next, next question again, if any of you who um, have an opinion on this is welcome to, answer, uh, welcome to answer. One of the things that is sort of unique about this RDCA DEP program is that we're gonna integrate different kinds of data, both clinical trial data, natural history data, and registry data. Um, and I know each of you have really good individual disease databases. We're also thinking about doing this across multiple diseases. Can you talk to any advantages or disadvantages that you can see of both combining different kinds of data and also including different diseases within the same database? And Ron, I know you can speak to the integration because you have already integrated some Frederick's data. So um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, we're really excited about the prospects of, of working as we already are with this wonderful uh, data integration and analytics program, um, largely because it's clear to us that it will deeply enrich our existing natural history data and will add new elements to that natural history data. It will um, permit us to um, develop uh, uh, gr greater or uh, uh, much better endpoints. Um, it will do so because if you look at our natural history database, as I mentioned, it's based on annual uh, examinations at, at our clinical sites. And uh, if you add to that the baseline data and um, uh, placebo arm data from clinical trials recently completed, you're, you, those data are collected far more frequently than annually and on the same patient. So what you're really doing is really enriching the natural history data you have uh, on each of those patients and our, our disease generally. Um, and with that additional data, you can um, do some analysis that will, you, you heard Klaus talk about the importance of the confounding effect of placebo. And you know, if there's a confounder that has haunted every one of our two dozen clinical trials, it's been the placebo effect. How to dampen it, how to identify it, how to uh, predict it in advance, how to account for it. And with these additional data from placebo harm clinical trial data, my gosh, you know, and you analyze that and you can, you can identify and predict and account for placebo data. Another way in which we are really excited about this program helping us is in uh, designing better clinical outcome measures, better endpoints for very difficult to measure um, parameters that are very important to our patients. But again, if, it, if the therapy is intended to, at best, provide incremental benefit, 
how do you measure incremental benefit in something at, like fatigue? Everybody needs a fatigue measure. Nobody's got them as far as I know. Maybe these data will help us develop uh, a viable uh, fatigue outcome measure. Another aspect that's really important to our disease group, and I know a good number of other disease groups, is we need far better clinical outcome measures, clinical endpoints for something like cardiac. I mean, we cannot conduct a clinical trial in Friedrich's ataxia in which the biggest killer is you know, congestive heart failure. We cannot conduct a clinical trial based on the standard uh, parameter, the standard endpoint of how long to death. I mean, it just doesn't work. We need something far more sensitive to change in cardiac endpoints. Maybe, again, these kind of uh, data additions, enrichment, will, will help us develop endpoints like that. I would say there's some trade-offs. Of course, the idea of a universal database um, and integrated you know, biorepository for all rare diseases is a tremendous concept. And it also has some realistic challenges. Uh, for example, you know, core data elements that might be easy to find consensus on are great, and it's a good start. But if you really want to dig into the uniquenesses of each disease, you have to go beyond just core data elements. And the degree to which you can get a bunch of different stakeholders to agree on the non-core data elements will in part shape how broadly you can apply sort of the integrated database. Um, the other thing is getting you know, folks to agree on the difference between what you could do and what you should do, right? <laughs> Uh, big difference, and you know, in a world of finite resources and finite time, uh, when the clock is ticking for every patient, you have to prioritize, and someone's got to be willing to say, "Okay, I, I accept that, and we move forward." Maybe with a little asterisk of, "I reserve the right to change something down the line as long as it doesn't affect you know whatever is being collected up front." So again, it's sort of the plasticity that needs to be built in. I think it's important as well, I think, um, beforehand to focus on uh, what is the uh, question that you're trying to answer. So if the question is how best to plan a trial, then it's important to have uh, some trial data. Like you said, a placebo data is important to uh, predict uh, placebo effects, uh, dropout uh, as well in a trial. So it's important to have that data as part of your set. If the question more is looking at uh, long-term outcomes, then of course clinical trial data is not gonna be that helpful for that. So it depends really on the question that um, is being posed, and that will focus what data um, is important to, uh, uh, to look at. I think um, in medicine, clinicians are really taught to not only address the part of the patient that is maybe going wrong, um, but also to look at the entire patient as a whole. And so I think that this platform is a great opportunity for researchers and industry and regulators to be able to take different aspects, different variables um, of research and make that into a whole patient, you know, per se. So while the registries are great as far as collecting longitudinal data, you need to be able to integrate biomarkers and clinical trials so that for researchers, it's a really easy one-stop shop. And I think you've, between your comment and Kevin's comment, you've hit on some, something that's really important is, of course, we'll have all this data from multiple diseases in the database, and depending on your question, you'll be able to mine them in different ways. You may be looking at a disease progression model of one specific disease, in which case you'll pull data from that specific disease. You may be interested in a more general biomarker that uh, could be involved in many related diseases, and you may want to look at the changes in that biomarker in many related diseases. And I think that's what we're trying to get to here. It's, the database is a platform, and certainly the CPATH quantitative medicine team will, will be working with that platform. There'll be analytics available to anyone, and at least some of that data will be available for anybody else to download and do whatever research they need to do as well, depending on how the data is shared with the database. So I think absolutely it depends on the question which data is going to be most valuable, and that's why we're taking such a broad approach to what kind of data we'd like to include in the platform. 
And perhaps with that, um, it's, maybe it's time to open up the floor and ask if anybody in the audience has any questions. The panel will no doubt continue to discuss things with each other as well, but any questions from the floor? There's certainly one at the back, one over there. Just please wait for a microphone so the people online can also hear. We can always hear Marshall. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to put on my clinician's hat for just a moment. One of the things we've run across, when I started in the field in the 80s, we had, you know, 10 to 20 diseases that we were really looking at seriously. And you could run registries out of a clinical program um, as a research type study. You know, it's probably 8,000 plus now and growing on a regular basis. So I actually think, this is more of a comment and observation, that actually having the patients driving the data collection, the data input with good guardrails around the system is a much more sustainable system because what we're finding is in the clinical programs, we can no longer sustain running a registry for every single disease and the electronic medical records are nowhere near what they need to be to actually stop to sort of stock these things. That's my comment. My question, and this would actually be more for Pam, I think, can you talk a little bit about legacy issues for registries? I'd say 90% of the registries I've seen over the last 30 years are gone. The data's lost for a variety of reasons. Talk a little bit, how do you handle legacy issues? So I think Vanessa really touched upon it a little bit in her presentation. I think addressing having patients be at the center of it and being able to collaborate as many of the panelists have, have talked about in their examples is really key to make sure that the, that the data is available for the next umpteen years moving forward. Um, it doesn't do anybody any good for it to be locked in a box um, except for maybe the person who had the key to the box the first time that we've lost the key. Um, We've seen firsthand and have experienced all of us in many different shapes and forms how hard it is to, it is to capture this data, the sacrifice that people make um, to make it available. So to me, it's just criminal not to make it available and leverage it. So from our perspective, um, North Platform and specifically was designed to maintain um, that long-term legacy and that access. And the idea of being able to create nested sub-studies, et cetera, was so that you could satisfy multiple stakeholders and still, as Vanessa said, um, keep the community together. I, I would just add to that, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the one constant here is, is the patient. And in many of these rare diseases, they start in pediatric divisions and then they move on to adult. And we know that, you know, companies come into our space and you know it's exciting and it's great but sometimes for reasons that nobody can control then they leave the space and so having a, a registry that is you know from the patients and is in control of the patients is critical to making sure that that data is collected and can then be used uh, you know widely uh, across the spectrum so it's great Sorry, I was taking notes. Um, this is Kate from Santa Fe Genzyme again. I, I think congratulations to all of you. What you've done and the contributions that you've made to what's known about your diseases is really incredible. Um, and I think the fact that you've done that all as patient organizations um, speaks to the professional capacity of your groups and to the capability of patient communities. And as an advocate, I just think it's really terrific because industry always thinks that we know how to do it best. Um, and I, I think that the five of you and the seven of the moderators have really shown that that's not always the case. So um, just really a big congratulations. And I think my question sort of goes to if you can do this, what else can you do? Um, you know, we think a lot about in the rare disease space sort of the cost of disease, right? What's the, the financial cost of the disease and how ultimately will that impact down the road of treatment and an ability for a patient to access it? And so in hearing you talk about your registries, what I'm thinking is, are you thinking about capturing sort of that cost of disease, how much does it cost for me to take the ancillary medications or modifications um, that they may need for medical equipment? And are you also thinking how to capture sort of caregiver fatigue, um, caregiver burnout, so that that data becomes available longitudinally down the road? Yes. 
and uh, it's a it's a great question, and thank you for the for the uh, support. Um, so there are many costs to a chronic disease. Uh, there are even more to a rare chronic disease. And so, for instance, it's not just the, uh, the financial uh, cost of the meds or the transportation to the clinics or what have you, but it's also lost opportunities. And, you know, for example, in NMO, only 20% of patients are able to work a full-time job. Most of them have very advanced educations. Uh, many of them have, you know, successful careers that came rather abruptly to an end because of this debilitating disease. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the idea of cost is a sort of multi-dimensional question. Um, we, we published a, a quality of life and patient experience paper about a month and a half ago in neurology that asked many of those questions. Um, so, you know, one of the things that was not a surprise was that uh, NMOSD patients uh, 65% of them are initially diagnosed as having MS. And it takes, on average, about a year to correct that diagnosis after multiple rounds of MS meds that are often um, adverse to NMO. And you know that's sort of the way it begins. And then other things cascade and layer on top of the situation, from you know, difficult family dynamics and employment issues to medical costs and caregiver, you know, time and effort and drawing away from their opportunity to work, et cetera. So it's, a, it's really a compounded issue. Uh, but, you know, there are ways to address some of these things through, um, you know, support uh, in ways that are not always obvious, um, peer support groups, uh, ways to keep, you know, patients informed and, um, Again, going back to the idea of resilience, not just in terms of, of disease uh, affliction, but also, you know, one of the things that was a surprise in this paper was there is a subset of NMOSD patients who have severe physical health, but very good emotional health. And that speaks to a resilience that is a, you know, sort of psychological um, aspect of the disease that also, if unaddressed, comes at yet another cost. Uh, I, so in our disorder, you know, the kids and adolescents and young adults with PWS uh, have a lot of behavioral issues and uh, mental illness, including psychosis, uh, temper outbursts, anxiety. And so it's not only the burden on the individual, but we've also looked at the, the burden on the primary caregiver, which is, mm profound. I mean, 80, more than 80% of our parents say that they've, they've changed their work or given up work to take care of their child. Um, the, the stress of constantly caring for a challenging personality, uh, we can see because we've measured the, you know, the quality of life of, of, of that caregiver, and the majority of individuals are kind of in a range where they would be at risk for mental health issues themselves. So. Uh, yeah, it's it's just compounded, you know, out-of-pocket costs, costs for therapies, uh, you know. So so yes, we are looking at that because we understand what a tremendous burden it is on the individual and on their their entire family. I'll just add. Um, short answer to your question is yes, we we can do some of that, um, um, and we are doing some of that. We've conducted a couple of surveys directly aimed at burden of disease. Um, we've also added some questions to our demographic patient registry to help report on that. Um, I will also say that we have some cautions about this whole exercise uh, because um, we're a little bit concerned about abuse of those kinds of data. Um, to help set pricing, for example. Uh, and if, if that's the case, uh, we're concerned that all these burden of disease data sets will be compiled. And some of them are very difficult, almost impossible, as Michael said, to monetize. Um, you know, how do you monetize a day of school lost or a, a day of work lost? Um, but we don't want to see those kind of data compiled and say, okay, 
This therapy is going to save the healthcare system uh, $250 million uh, over time. So uh, we'll set our price accordingly because no one, I don't think, would rationally argue that current health care costs are sustainable to begin with. So if all we're doing with the new therapy is trying to set a price that would, you know, at the same tar at the same offset cost, then we're just, you know, prolonging an unsustainable system. I think thanks to all of you for the great answers. Part of my motivation in asking that, I think, Jane, um, to your point, you're saying, what else do we want to collect? You're thinking about what surrogate endpoints could be if it's a, a parent taking care of a child and they wake up five times in the night as opposed to eight, or they miss you know, one week of work as opposed to nine. You know, perhaps there's something to dig in on there and say, hey, that actually is making a measurable impact. Or um, can I walk my child <laughs> to the school? Exactly, right? Like if it, the six minute walk test is a poor endpoint, what else could you substitute that comes out to that same answer? And I'm, Ron, I know you and I were at the same meeting. I'm thinking of the Spark example with the, right. the blindness city test. You know, yeah. Can you come up with a surrogate endpoint asking things in a, in a sort of patient provided way that get you to that same marker? And right. if you start capturing that in registries, maybe there's an opportunity to look back and say, we didn't think about it that way, but that actually is what the outcome is that's happening. Fully supportive of that. Yeah. You know, there's, there's another uh, thought that I might just want to put out there, and that is, you know, it's one thing to think about costs directly related to the disease itself, but there are other costs for example, in uh, autoimmune diseases where the treatments often change the immune response to infection, there are you know, secondary uh, costs, infective you know, treatment or time in the hospital, et cetera. Um, I'd also just mention that you know, none of this is clean in terms of this patient has this disease only. Many autoimmune patients have more than one diseases autoimmune disease patients get cancer, they get other things as well. And so it's, it's really a moving target. And so I think, you know, uh, again, going back to the, the real insight that, that Dr. Dunn and FDA provided the NMO community is to really clearly define as much as is possible, but realize that's the definition at the moment and things will evolve, we'll learn more um, and address those as we go. But, you know, starting somewhere, and really unambiguously testing a hypothesis in a clinical trial is really important, and then exploratory endpoints where appropriate can help change the, the landscape, as you say. Are there any other questions for the panel from the audience or just questions about the, um, the stage platform? I think we've exhausted you. You've run out of questions, <laughs> which is extraordinary to me. I didn't know anyone ever ran out of questions. <laughs> any more comments from any of the panelists as we wrap up there? I, I would just like to add a panelist's uh, encouragement for all the, the patient groups in the room and online uh, to seriously consider participating in this program. I, I think you've heard enough about it today to recognize its tremendous potential uh, in helping you uh, really get to treatments faster um, and by um, improving your endpoints, by improving your attraction uh, or attractiveness to industry partners who will come to you because you do have this enriched uh, natural history data um, and want to work with you to design their clinical trials, to identify their targets. We've got industry partners in this room right now that came to us because uh, they said, we knew what they needed. And we've got an industry partner in this room that has always referred to our triad as a, um, a turnkey operation, just add good drug. And so that's what's at stake. Um, uh, and that's what you can do. Uh, that's what you can accomplish by participating in a wonderful program uh, like this. And I'm just indebted to the people who set it up. If I could just add a couple of other thoughts. You know, there is a, there can be a tremendous solitude and aloneness in a rare disease. 
And that's something that really needs to be addressed quickly when a patient is diagnosed with something they've never heard of and none of their friends have ever heard of it and their friends have never heard of it. The flip side of that mindset is the power of rare, such that each individual patient has so much potential to influence the field. And I'll just use the example that in the clinical trials done so far in NMOSD, there have been about 400-ish patients enrolled. And if you extrapolate from the prevalence worldwide on average, there are probably 400,000 patients, meaning every patient enrolled in a clinical trial who had the courage to enroll, not knowing, not being able to pick which arm they would be in, even though the trial might have been weighted for two-thirds experimental drug, one-third placebo, in a very frightening disease, each patient really influenced and benefited thousands of other patients. And I think this kind of message goes a long way to not only helping you know, patients feel like they are participating in their own remedy, but also in reaching out to other diseases. For example, NMO is to MS, as MS might be to lupus, et cetera. And there is this chain of connectivity that occurs when you start saying, yeah, I have NMO, but NMO is an autoimmune disease. And somebody else says, yeah, I have an autoimmune disease too. But it's not NMO, but there are things that we share. And it just creates this tapestry, I guess would be one word, where there are different textures and different um, determinants that make up the picture. And then if you reach upstream to autoimmune disease, you get to a point where now you're talking about where did tolerance go wrong in all of the autoimmune diseases. It had to start someplace with immune checkpoints, for example. And so really what it does is it takes an individual rare disease and it unites them all in a picture that reaches back up into the origins that might be useful to help address all rare diseases, autoimmune and otherwise. Thank you. Any final comments from any of our other panelists? I would just say I think it's, uh, it's such an exciting time in rare disease research. So, so none of us you know, wants to be sort of in this club. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, just the fact that industry is now, I think, much more open to incorporating the voice of the patient into the drug development process and really understands the value of doing so you know, uh, beyond just feeling good about it. Uh, and I think the fact that the regulatory agencies also are appreciating and encouraging and finding ways to engage patients and, and uh, you know, hoping to continue to, to grow that, the technology that is out there and the ability for us to really understand rare diseases and progression of disease in the setting of the home rather than just in the clinic, and the, of course, genetics, which is one of my favorites. Uh, the ability of you know us to understand how genetic variants might be influencing uh, disease progression or response to to drugs. I just think there's so many possibilities, and and having platforms like this to be able to really understand and uh, fully utilize that information is is great. So, is it working now? Okay. <laughs> Um, so I think that all the comments that have already been made are exceptional and really spot on. So I won't repeat anything, but what one thing that I, I think is really great about the platform is that it truly is patient powered. Patients are in the best position um, to have the best health outcomes if they feel empowered and if they feel educated. And so a platform like this, I think, is really going to move the needle forward in research, in patient engagement in research, and bringing everybody together so that it's not just silos of researchers and clinicians and patients and patient advocacy groups, but everybody collaborating and working together. And that's, that's truly, I think, the wave of the future. So I can't say any more, except maybe we should all just do a joint drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. 
And just before we wrap up the, pa the, the panel, I, we've just heard some wonderful stories from organizations that have done a lot, gathered a lot of data, and given us some really best practices for where we should be. I think Alexandra just really summed up for us that we all need, we're all in this together. It's a club we didn't, wa we didn't want to join as a rare disease community, but we've joined the club, and if we work together, we will make a difference. Um, the next steps for this, this project as we, as we move forwards, we, we do have the beginnings of the platform built. We are at the position we can accept data. We're beginning to play with what analytics we're going to build of generally across the platform. And, uh, I'm just going to continue my plea that the, this is a community project. We need to hear from you after this meeting. We need to hear from you if you want to share data. We want to hear from you if you have ideas of what analytics would be useful to you. I hope I will talk to every person into this in this room again. I'm sure Pam is thinking exactly the same thing, and we'll be, we are absolutely all in this together. So this is the beginning. This is a launch meeting. This is not the end. We've heard some amazing stories, stories up here on this panel, and I thank my panelists very, very much for that. But we will be talking to you all again, and please do continue to engage, continue to talk to us, because we need to learn from you. The, the patients are the experts on their diseases. The industry is an expert on drug, in drug development. The regulators know what they need to see to approve a drug. We need to work on this together. So thank you all, um, and thank you very much to my panelists. So while they take a quick photo here, I'll just let everyone know we have had some questions about whether the slides will be available from the earlier presentations. And on the front of your booklets, there is a, a, a website here, cpath.org backslash rdcadap. That's the website that you can visit to download slides, look at the audio recording. Uh, an email will go out when those slides are posted there. So everyone who is watching online or here in the room with us will receive a notification when those become available. But just so you know, that's the place you'll go to access those when they are ready. Thanks again Thank to this last panel. is really great information. And I would like to bring up our final speaker of the day to, to close the program out, Billy Dunn, who is the director of the Division of Neurology Products at FDA. Thank you. How y'all doing? End of the day. Um, I'm in the unenviable position of uh, talking to you after Jane just explained that uh, everybody's exhausted and, uh, and tired. So uh, on the one hand, I, I have prepared some comments. On the other hand, I feel like this panel we just heard, absolutely spectacular. I, I was so impressed with what I heard. Many of the points that I thought about making that I think about with this project that's so near and dear to me, uh, it's very important scientifically, and, and I, I really believe very strongly in it. Uh, these points w were made here. Um, Dr. Yamey, where, where did Michael go? Where did Dr. Yamey go? He's walking across the back. You know, just, just in a, a span of a couple minutes, you made points about the power of the rare disease patients. You know, you spoke about how important it is, how the, the effect that one patient can have a point that I definitely wanted to make, you made it for me. Uh, you unwittingly actually made another point for me, which is the need to be inclusive about our participation in that. When we have a situation like rare diseases where one patient can make such an outsized contribution to an overall database, it speaks all the more strongly to the need for comprehensive uh, participation from all the patients because we have to characterize things as fully as possible. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just astounding. You also then went on to do, I'm, I'm keying on what you said just because I heard it just, just at the end of the panel. There were so many points throughout the panel, but you also made the point about the relatedness of diseases. And I was just talking to Dr. Romero Klaus. We, were, we had a telephone call just the other day about how we were uh, discussing the, the multi-axial nature, the three-dimensional nature of this database and how exciting that is. And th these individual databases for the uh, diseases will reside within RDCA DAP. Uh, Joseph, where's Joseph? So the, the, the DAP initiative, I guess we're calling it internally now. Um, they'll, they'll reside there for individual diseases, but they will allow this exploration of related disease characteristics. You can go in any number of directions. We were using an analogy of, of the, the, the entire framework being a parking garage and individual disease being a car. You can analyze all the cars of that type in that parking garage, or you can go across the different kinds of cars and sort of what kind of transmissions they have, what kind of wheels they have, what color they all are. You can, there's many, many diseases which we group 
uh, phenotypically, and as we gain genotypic specificity about what we're, what we're looking at, we will be able to find links between these diseases and learn things about them that would be impossible without this effort. You can already hear in my comments that we're unprepared how strongly I feel about the power of this effort. Um, I'm, I'm extraordinarily tempted to, to, to throw these pages away and just, and just say a few things about how strongly I feel about this, uh, but I will, I will go through a few things, and before, I don't even know, yeah, I've made a few silly slides, but that's fine. Um, you know, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna congratulate folks uh, who worked towards, towards uh, getting this meeting set up. Many people who are attending may not realize, um, a phrase I don't usually use, I'll use it here, because it's really true, uh, what a heavy lift this was. Um, this, this is a remarkable gathering. The background and infrastructure that went into preparing this is extraordinary. Uh, there are people here who haven't been on the stage who have been working diligently, tirelessly, uh, on a daily basis uh, to pull this together. Uh, the importance of the effort is, is what that represents, and the fact that this is gonna go on to really be a, a game changer in the rare disease space is why the agency is so behind this, why we're devoting so much energy to this, why our colleagues at the Critical Path Institute and NORD have been so um, collegial, gracious, involved, engaging, dedicated uh, to, to this process. It's been truly astounding and humbling for me to see. Uh, the, uh, I, I think back uh, June 17th, I was, at a, uh, I was at a conference out of town on June 17th, and uh, I flew back on June 18th. And I flew back, got out of the plane, and had to rush from the airport over to a meeting that has become known internally as the Rainy Day Meeting. Uh, uh, Teresa and Michelle and I were there. And uh, we went to the Rainy Day Meeting at Nord's headquarters. Now, where's Peter? Where's Peter? There he is. Yeah, you remember that meeting? Uh, obviously, all the CPATH folks who flew in for that, but Nord was gracious enough to host that meeting. We had had a couple telephone calls beforehand. Uh, to get this off the ground, uh, some, some kind of you know, interested questions. Oh, that's interesting. How's this gonna work? Well, what are we gonna do? Why do you think this is so important? Uh, and then we got together in person and we had the rainy day meeting and it was spectacular. It started at 3.30 and, I, and we closed the parking garages down, as I recall. Uh, we had to sprint out to, to rescue our vehicles from closed parking garages downtown. Uh, and this, this, despite the, the jumbled mess my mind was with the things that I had uh, been through at the other conference and the things I was trying to attend to upon returning home, I, uh, I, uh, that meeting stands out in my mind uh, as a very, very important meeting. All of this work has come together since then. Uh, it's just been an extraordinary effort. Uh, and I really, really wanna thank all the people who worked so hard on the strict timeline to pull this together. Um, it has been one of the more remarkable efforts I've seen. Um, I think, all, I've, I'm really pleased, I, I know so many faces here, some of y'all don't know me, but most, most do, or at least know what I do, but I'm Billy Dunn. Uh, I direct the uh, neurology and neuroscience efforts for the Center for Drugs at FDA. Um, that's, that's important because we're very involved in rare diseases, uh, and I've been listening closely uh, to the meeting. I was very involved in, um, in, in a lot of this daily work uh, that, that went on. I couldn't attend everything, uh, but so many people were able to. But I have had my finger on the pulse of this from its inception, and I believe very strongly on it. So I, I will have a few comments. Uh, Klaus, should I use the curvy one? Is this the right one? Yes. Okay, all right. Yeah, no, it didn't happen. Right. Curvy one? No, yeah, all right, so time is right. What does that mean? We're seeing a, a changing drug development landscape. There's no question about this. Uh, the science is changing. We're seeing increased genetic characterization of diseases that provide new targets to us. We're seeing increased molecular subtyping of diseases, Re recognition of molecular drivers allowing us to target very precisely defined populations in ways that we could not previously. New drug mechanisms are available to us, anti oligonucleotides, which I had the great privilege of approving the first one by the agency. Same thing with small interfering RNAs, same privilege. I'm humbled by that, by that event. In these instances, they allow us to specifically target very precise genetic underpinnings of disease, underpinnings that in some instances may be shared only by a few patients, truly only a few, sometimes even one, we can, we can characterize them so specifically. The types and targets of drugs are changing. We're seeing a move in drug development to fewer drugs targeting common diseases with more drugs targeting rare diseases. For those in the rare disease space who don't know that, that is a sea change that I have witnessed over the past years. Uh, I've been at FDA for quite a while, and we are really seeing a big difference. We're one of the busiest groups at FDA in terms of uh, one surrogate for our work is the number of meetings that we have with sponsors, and, and we have a lot, and there's so many of them in the rare disease space. It's, it's, it's part and parcel of our work. Um, you know, every hour, 
of every day. I shift gears from, from one disease to the next, and, and we have very sophisticated people coming to discuss with us very complicated issues, and so much of that is in the rare disease space, and it's, it's, it's inspirational, uh, and it's exciting, and it, it, it's, it's very engaging, and I'm so confident we're on the right track to leverage this scientific work to find cures for rare diseases as a whole, which is exactly what the name of this movement's all about. We're able to focus on disease subtypes, and as I just mentioned, we, can, we have an increase in these precision targeted drugs that have come to me. Since in 2018, over 50% of what we call our new molecular entities were for rare disease drug products. Over half of, of, of new drugs approved by us were for rare diseases. That's extraordinary. Over the past 10 years, the proportion of active investigational applications, that is drugs that are under investigation but not yet approved, that are regulated by myself and my colleagues at the agency, that's for, that for rare diseases, that's risen from 3% to 15% of all of our active investigational efforts. Okay. But as we heard, Peter, you mentioned uh, in your opening comments, 95% of rare diseases, despite this sea change, still have no treatment at all. There's so many of them. There's so many of these diseases and so many of them need therapy. So the time is right. The time is now to bring this effort to bear on the development of drugs for rare diseases in order to leverage this evolving science and knowledge in this space. So we've been talking, you know, geez, on, there we go. We've been talking about a problem, uh, and I think it's fair to call it a problem in some ways. Um, you know, FDA's experience with rare disease trials, the numbers of, of interventions coming in, these are common areas of discussion. And one of the reasons that I'm here and I'm so engaged in this, and internally I, I, I see myself as, uh, as helping to, to lead this effort. Externally, I certainly seek to, uh, seek to assist where I can. I have the great privilege to help lead a few, a few things there as well. But this is such a frequent area of discussion in neurology and neuroscience. We're really on the forefront of rare disease research and drug development. Neurologic disease includes many more rare diseases than any other organ-specific category. Over 80% of the nearly, or even more than 7,000 rare diseases are neurological in nature. So we really, this is part and parcel of our daily work. We have a lot of experience here, and we want to be able to leverage the information that we're, we're uh, uh, obtaining from this effort. So we, we, I'm going to skip some of this. This com, uh, the common areas I have here about how to how to deal with limited numbers of patients, uh, targeted subgroups, the appropriate control group. We've heard about these things from various speakers. The challenges that you all now at the conclusion of this meeting, if you weren't already familiar with, these challenges are very specific to the rare disease space. One that I will highlight, these are very important things to get right in any disease space, but when you have small numbers of patients, it becomes particularly challenging. And there's something else that's very important about the rare disease space is that because of those small numbers of patients, we have to contemplate the use of external controls more so than we might in other areas. And having a very rigorous effort to characterize disease uh, outside of any individual clinical trial enhances our ability to entertain the use, at least partially, if not completely, of external controls. That's really important. Dr. Crudis, uh, who I'm so pleased to have uh, on the neurology staff, uh, a real expert in quantitative analysis and, and, and a tremendous addition, mentioned, uh, you know, mentioned how important it was to have contemporaneous data. I, you know, I talk about that a lot internally. The more we have a, a live dynamic process accruing data, the more powerful that's going to be. So this is, this is real important for us to deal with. We've also listened to the patient voice on the desire, especially in the rare disease space, for fewer patients on placebo. We recognize this is a hindrance to, uh, to patient enrollment. We also, I think, have had good dialogue uh, about, uh, uh, Dr. Yeaman brought up the experience in NMO. I, I got kind of tingly when I heard you relate that story. It's, one of, it's, 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 a, it's a story from 2013 to now that makes me really, really proud of the work that the community did. Um, it, it, is, it is true that we were able to overcome the placebo issue there, but it is still true that this is a, a, an issue of great concern to the community, and we have heard that uh, patients want to experience placebo, if at all, for as little time as possible. This type of an effort can speak directly to that. Uh, we also have a need for better understanding of disease progression, natural history, better comparator arms, endpoint understanding. These are all things that we need to do. And all of these issues speak to the need for an understanding in detail uh, the disease characterization in order to best inform drug development. When I meet with sponsors in this space who, are, who want to develop drugs, these are the questions I get asked. 
these are the these are the answers I want to provide, and sometimes I don't have the information I need to give an answer. And nothing frustrates me more than that. I go to work so that drug developers can come to me and get the information they need to bring these drugs to patients. That's why I do what I do. If I can't do that, I am so frustrated. I'm, in, I'm engaged in so many activities where we are trying to get answers so that we can tell the developers what they need to know to go do their job and get those drugs out there. So this is, this is all about that. You know, I find myself thinking a lot about the fact that we've been talking about problems. I don't know. You know, you, some of you heard me use my glass half full analogy before. You know, glass half full, empty. Depends on what's in the glass, right? That's, that's my little joke. Okay, but I, here I see a real opportunity. I see glass half full here. Um, it's, it's not a problem. I think we have an opportunity because we know what we're facing. Our opportunity to have uh, seen the challenges ahead of us is not a problem. It's, it's an opportunity. We, ha we define what what we need to overcome. That's much better than not knowing what your obstacles are. We, we have the knowledge, and so I see here, uh, instead of being constrained by challenges, my view is that we have a chance to maximize the quality and the usability of the data that we do have, and to support the rapid incorporation of new and evolving data, and this effort is focused exactly on doing that. That's what this is all about, and we have to do that because you know, I, I tell folks that I work with uh, in, in development space, we don't ask you to do what you can't do. If we have a population of you know, millions of people who, who have a disease, sure, we can talk about large global trials. If there's 30 people in the world that have a disease, you know, this notion that we sit back and say, oh, well, you know, we're the FDA and you're going to go do a randomized double-blind placebo control trial. What, what are you going to do? You've got to figure out how, how you're going to maximize the information from those 30 people. So we, we have to, we must go out and find paths to succeed in evaluating therapies for patients with these types of diseases of limited numbers. That's a must, we have to do that. So we know that, and we have an opportunity here to bring a tool to bear on that that is going to dramatically enhance our ability to succeed. So rather than thinking that there is not enough information to adequately inform drug development, we can use the power of this data and analytics platform to directly address critical issues in drug development, especially some of the ones that I've mentioned that are so important, some of the big ticket issues that come up over and over and over, uh, the patient population to be studied, the enrollment criteria, the size and duration of the trial, endpoint and outcome selection, which is especially relevant for rare diseases for the reasons we've already heard, and choice of control group, as I mentioned, including the possible use of external controls, which is critical in this space. Now, many who know me know that this is an area that I am deeply passionate about data sharing. And if you distill this effort out, that that's what this is. If we don't have data sharing, this effort is kind of stillborn. It's not going anywhere. Um, this, this relies on the, on the input of data with all the slides you saw, much fancier slides than I know how to make. I know how to put a couple words on a slide, and that's about it. Um, but you saw pictures and diagrams and inputs and outputs and transformations. It was fantastic. Uh, it makes, you know, every time I hear Klaus talk about something, I get more excited about the project. Um, but this project cannot occur without data input. It's absolutely critical. General efforts are underway with, with company policies in place. Uh, we, we know that there's a commitment to data sharing. You can't go to, a, to an industry-focused drug developer, go to their website, and not see a data transparency, a data access, a data sharing policy. But those are still individual policies. And what we have here is we have the opportunity here to aggregate and have everybody contribute, not in a parochial constrained way. Somebody in the back, and I'm sorry, I don't know who it was, asked, will, uh, uh, or maybe it was the front, somebody asked, um, you know, will we still be able to control those data or have access to our own data? Of course, of course. This is, we have tremendous experience with the Critical Path Institute and with NORD with regard to their approaches to data, and it's, it's truly altruistic. It's about bettering the community and allowing every member of the scientific and patient community uh, to benefit from that aggregated data. That's what it's all about. So the RDCA DAP is predicated on the power of data sharing, and there's increased recognition throughout the scientific community that being a good scientific citizen means sharing your data. You know, the, something I started saying a couple of years ago and that I think is really starting to resonate is that people are realizing that pre-competitive work benefits competitive industry efforts. It, that didn't used to be understood so well, but I think everybody gets it now, that, it, that this pre-competitive and even non-competitive work is critical to the field overall and will further all of our efforts, whether they are commercial interests, academic interests, regulatory interests, it doesn't matter what it is, it benefits everyone. Most importantly, the patients who are waiting for their therapies. 
So we know from experience, we have a lot of experience, uh, and we certainly know from experience uh, that data sharing provides a key way to address the challenges that I noted above and that many today have noted. Um, data sharing is a very, very powerful technique, and it's one of the reasons that I am so dedicated to it. I'm very passionate about this. I, I also have the great privilege of, of, of working closely with, with colleagues at CPATH on, on a data sharing initiative focused on industry data sets there, initially in the Alzheimer's space and branching out into all of the neuroscience efforts. Uh, it, is a, uh, it is a source of great attention from me, as is uh, data sharing with a number of other entities. Um, we we uh, value that very highly because whether it's a large disease or a rare disease, the benefits are there, the benefits are the same, and bringing our expertise to bear on that is critical. One of the very important things about any data sharing effort is that it provides a, um, a structure for standardizing data and ensuring a certain quality of data such that people talk about regulatory quality. I always kind of get a little, eh, yeah. I mean, it's true we do have some rules you got to follow, but really what we're talking about is good science, right? We want to have the data be good quality data that, that, that adheres to scientific standards and is suitable for scientific exploration. Poor quality data does nobody any good. So by bringing data into an aggregated database, but with technical experts who know how to get it into that database in a clean, interpretable way, that, that's a very, very important side effect of having an effort like this is that it raises the quality level of all the data collection efforts and all the data submission efforts. Data sharing is ideally suited to comprehensive and detailed disease characterization. Remember, disease characterization is what this particular effort today is all about. And it really allows us to kind of find that unicorn, the win-win. I think this is really what this is. We get increased knowledge accompanied by increased efficiency. It's pretty rare that you, you don't have to you know, pay a penalty for that. And really, I think it's, the, it's really the only way to go in contemporary science, given the knowledge explosion. We really can't do things in a piecemeal fashion. I mean, we have exponential growth in knowledge, and it's going to continue and continue and continue. And so having this type of, of aggregated, uh, filterable, queryable data is really the key. So it's very quite, it's quite obvious, you know, we see a tremendous opportunity here at the agency. Uh, we appreciate so much Congress's wisdom in providing uh, funding for us to initiate this, this. and uh, we have great hopes, I think more than hopes, we have expectations, Teresa. We, we feel very strongly that this is a durable, uh, fundamental shift in our approach to uh, the involvement of the community, our support of the involvement of the community, and our regulatory approach to rare diseases. We're going to expect to see output from this data analytics platform as well as the other aspects of the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator. We're going to expect to see those efforts brought to bear on our rare disease interactions with sponsors and eventually result in the provision of, uh, of new therapies for patients. We absolutely think that's, that's critical. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that, that, did it change? No, it didn't change. So one of the things that we have here is we have, uh, you know, already as we start this, we have demonstrated success in this area. And, and really, uh, CPATH and NORD's involvement in this space is no accident at all. Uh, both of these organizations have skill and experience with innumerable successes. We heard about this. We heard Joseph point out that there are 80, 000, over 80,000 patients in the CPATH database. Uh, where was Joseph? You said, yeah, no, right here. Yeah, over 80,000. That's, that's remarkable. When I think about some of the databases I interact with developers on and what we're trying to kind of squeeze the sponge as hard as we can and get every last drop of knowledge out of it, 80,000 patients, what a treasure trove. That's incredible. Peter, you mentioned you have over one million visits per month uh, to your website. That just shows the, 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 the interest, the, the ache for information that's out there, the need for information. Uh, that, that, that's extraordinary. You, you said you already have, I think I got this right, over 10,000 participants in your IM Rare registries. Uh, you know, un unbelievable participants, you know, not, not just patients from an individual study. We have 80,000 of those. They're individual records. We have participants who are now participating in multiple aspects of what you're doing. This is, a, this is a rich resource, it's extraordinary. Critical Path Institute has an established track, re track record and expertise in secure data sharing and integration. You're well known as a safe haven for industry. I have industry colleagues in the room and I know the value they place upon the uh, support that the agency provides to CPATH uh, and the fact that they know that their data are secure there and can, and can augment drug development successfully uh, in, a, in a non-risk environment. NORD has an established track, track record and expertise in the generation of robust patient registries and patient outreach, the connections, the awareness, the, uh, uh, the knowledge they will bring to this effort is unparalleled. 
In fact, I don't think we can envision this effort occurring at the agency without the participation of these two extraordinary groups. We have seen today examples of, of the things I mentioned and other successes that these organizations have achieved. So specifically, one of the things that's good, good to kind of speak to, and it, it's been spoken to already, but it, this DAP initiative, the Data and Analytics Platform, it establishes a database framework with a customized layer for any given disease. We've said that a few times, but it's good to make sure that we have that distilled version of it in everybody's mind. That's the critical component here. It provides a centralized, standardized infrastructure, um, and these, this, these characterizations will be rigorous with attention to established quality standards, as I mentioned. What we have is we have a, a disease-neutral background data framework. This is not, this, we have so many rare diseases, and building the, the reason this is valuable is true for any given disease. That goes without saying. It's, it's true, for, it's valuable for any given rare disease. But to build that from the ground up for each disease is, is challenging at, at, at best and, and impractical at worst. So what we have here is we have an opportunity to provide this platform of a disease neutral framework, which CPATH has worked on. Uh, you create this disease neutral framework that can be used for the construction of a database for any given rare disease. And this, this will you know, reduce the uh, stand-up time and investment. Disease-specific needs for any individual rare disease effort will be layered onto this framework to provide a rapid means for standardized yet customized aggregated data. This is where Nord's deep knowledge and relationship with the scientific community of varied rare diseases will allow for the customization of the database framework, the skeleton, the backbone of the effort, okay, to become alive and vibrant and dynamic for each individual disease. That's the critical piece as we have those parameters layered onto the framework. We can then conduct queries on the database of interest or, as I was mentioning before with the, with the car analogy, on domains of interest that may span multiple diseases. As we have also heard, this DAP is part of a larger three-part three part plan to address rare diseases, uh, to, to support and accelerate rare disease uh, development. We think that all of these are, are going to be critical components, but this one is foundational. The others can't really proceed well at all without this. So we're, we're, we're really getting this going. So I think that uh, we are truly in, in this new era. This, in my opinion, is absolutely a transformative effort that will revolutionize rare disease development going forward. Uh, this will specifically address the challenges that we've noted above. How fascinated I was by the challenges panel. I encounter these challenges every day, talk to people about them, but to have people up here kind of reflecting spontaneously in a way that wasn't scripted and that I certainly had no awareness of, to hear the challenges mentioned uh, about you know, how to use data better, how to get early involvement of groups, global considerations, um, not losing access to proprietary data, maintaining access long term when a, when, when a sponsor or a study shuts down, working pre-competitively, collaboration, more and more things I wrote down as notes from that panel, all of those things are the exact reason that we got this up and running. Internally, we discuss this effort. We discuss this effort with our colleagues from NORD, from CPATH, and we say these are the barriers that we're trying to overcome with this. For these folks to identify those very barriers is the things that they hope that need attention and that they hope will be addressed by this. And to know that that's why we've done this and that we're going to accomplish that, it, it, it's fantastic. There's really never been a more pressing need to bring an organized, efficient, and comprehensive, pre-competitive data sharing based approach to rare disease characterization efforts. There's never been a greater need. The science, as I said at the outset of my comments, is there to support this. The combination of CPATH and NORD with each group's expertise and vision will establish this to facilitate this disease characterization at a quality level that will meet the development needs of our industry colleagues and of my regulatory requirements that I operate under, as do my colleagues in, within the FDA. Another incredible thing is that RDCA DAP will be receptive to all forms of data. This is a critical need in rare diseases, as all available data must be leveraged. We don't have the luxury of having, you know, kind of cherry picking the, the, the very best data. We have to use everything available to us. I mentioned earlier that some of my data sharing efforts uh, early on and continuing to this day are focused on, on some large scale diseases like Alzheimer's, and we, we focus heavily on, on very large uh, industry data sets, a, a, a depth, uh, a richness, a breadth of data that's really hard to comprehend if you haven't actually worked with them. Um, 
Here, we don't necessarily have that. We have some of that, but, it, but, but not nearly as much, and we have fewer patients. So we have to be able to leverage, leverage all forms of these data. Joseph, you mentioned this right at the outset of, of your comments, and that really distinguishes this effort and makes it very exciting that we are going to raise that quality level. Klaus, you're going to be able to use all these different types of data in an aggregated way that recognizes their strengths, their limitations, but provides rigorous interpretability. That's critical. By creating this, this, this uh, DAP initiative, the need for one-off disease characterization efforts for every disease will be eliminated. I talked about how impractical those was, and to simply eliminate those and to have a welcoming platform for all comers from all rare diseases is, is just unbelievable to me. It's, uh, but all too believable as I see this meeting existing, occurring, and I see that the change has occurred. Instead, what we're going to have is a living, durable structure ready to establish in rapid order a data sharing database for any of these diseases. That will minimize startup time, it'll minimize development time, most importantly, it will minimize the delivery time of new therapeutics to patients, which is what this is all about. And I can think of no better note to end on than Joseph's point at the very outset of this, which is that I just told you about the rainy day meeting in June. Okay. The framework is already set up and ready to receive data. It's, it's just incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And in fact, as somebody noted, we've had people at this very meeting already approaching uh, uh, folks associated with the effort saying, how do I provide the data? I have data, I want to give it. And we're ready, we're, we're working, we're open for business. It's tremendous. So um, thank you to everyone, to everybody with a rare disease. This is a, this is a very important moment that is going to result in, in big improvements in the process for, for everybody that works in this space. Thank you for letting me talk to you at the end of the day. Uh, I hope you can hear how excited I am about this. Uh, we're going to continue to work very closely with everyone, and, uh, and I really appreciate everyone coming. Thank you very much.